I've decided to remove my treatment of the Elisha and the Bear story from Second Kings and defended by YouTuber Aaron K1994 because, frankly, his entire apologetic was lifted from the online work of Christian apologist James Patrick Holding. Holding has decided to venture onto YouTube himself, and thus I now have opportunity to deal with him directly. So if you will indulge me, I'd like to examine the number of ways Holding reworks the text so that he can turn Elisha into the victim of the story and the children into deserving recipients of divine justice. It's a rare treat when an apologist can offer such a full-blown glimpse into the cockamamie workings of their overactive imaginations, but James Holding doesn't hold back or disappoint in his loony, cartoony, apologetic, Elisha and the Bears retuned. The first way Holding tries to soften the biblical story of Elisha and the Bears is to minimize it by presenting it in cartoon form. Here characters can take on goofy, googly-eyed personas and the biblical tale can be delivered in a more juvenile format, more fitting his style. And remember, the entire story is only two verses long in 2 Kings. And he went up from thence unto Bethel, and as he was going up by the way, there came forth little children out of the city, and mocked him, and said unto him, Go up, thou bald head, go up, thou bald head. And he turned back, and looked on them, and cursed them in the name of the Lord. And there came forth two she-bears out of the wood, and tear forty and two children of them. In his presentation, Holding's first point is to try and establish that Elijah was not old when the biblical story took place, but was probably someone in his twenties. He needs to do this so that he can then assert Elisha's baldness was not caused by old age, but by his own hand, as a show of mourning over the recent death of his master Elijah. Holding makes no establishment regarding his assertion that Elisha's baldness is a sign of mourning other than his say-so, and in fact, where the person is said to have shaved his head in mourning in scripture, for example as in Job 1.20, the Bible clearly states this was done. However, the Bible makes no mention of Elisha having shaved his head. So this is an invention by Holding that he reads into the text. So the first way Holding tries to shift the blame for the children's murders onto the children themselves is to suggest that they were mocking Elisha's outward sign of mourning for his recently deceased master. In Holding's version, the children have to become evil and malicious, callous and cruel, for who other than little monsters would make fun of a man in mourning? These juvenile taunts now become worthy of death at the paws of wild beasts. Next, Holding tries to argue that the children of the tale were adolescents, not young grade schoolers, a veritable street gang of the ancient world. However, the text is very clear that the boys of the story are little, by the use of the Hebrew words katan and na'er, while Na'er can indeed indicate any boy from a toddler through adolescence, Katan qualifies this word by indicating the Na'er was young, a child. Holding tries to argue that Katan can mean insignificant in the sense that these teenage thugs were on the bottom rung of society, vagrant wanderers, as he calls them. But this is not what Katan means when found coupled with Na'er in the biblical texts. In every instance when Na'er is qualified by Katan, in the Hebrew scriptures, the identification is of young children, of a little one, not wise in the ways of the world, not of the street-hardened youths of Holding's apologetic creation. In Holding's online print defense of the Elisha story, he tries to argue that Katan doesn't always mean young, as in age, by dragging up a handful of biblical verses where the person being qualified by Katan is anything but a prepubescent. For example, he mentions Genesis 9.24 where it reads, And Noah awoke from his wine, and knew what his youngest son Ham had done unto him. Ham here is known to have been a grown man, married with a wife, hardly a young boy. But in each of these verses, 
Katan is not qualifying na'er, the Hebrew word for boy, but bain, the Hebrew word translated as son in English. So Katan in Genesis 9.24 is merely qualifying Ham as the youngest son in Noah's family, or Katan bain. Indeed, in all such verses, Katan is merely qualifying a specific son, not any random boy. The son could be an infant or could be an old man. The age has nothing to do with how Katan in these verses is qualifying the son. But what Holding has done here doesn't help his case. It actually sinks it further. For if Katan is being used in the Elisha story as it was used in Holding's example of Genesis 9.24, then what Second Kings is telling us is the children mocking Elijah were the youngest boys, Katan Na'er, of the city of Bethel. And no one is foolish enough to argue that the youngest of Bethel's male population were teenagers, that there were no younger boys in the city, are they? Indeed, Holding's wild imagination is able to take him from little children, Katan Na'er, to homeless youths engaged in robbery and banditry, and perhaps even the theft of animals from surrounding farmsteads. The Bible's sparse story and Holding's fantasies becomes a tale about an outlaw gang of rovers who survived on their own, probably by robbing others of their lives and property, causing innocents to spiral into poverty and die of starvation. Oh, the humanity! Again, no biblical support whatsoever for Holding's newly spun tale, but it makes for a good cartoon. Holding's attention then turns to the bears of the story. These creatures, too, are innocent victims in the face of the massive horde of teenage thugs mocking poor Elijah as he walked towards Bethel in Holding's newly reworked rendition of the biblical tale. Holding points out that bears of the region would not have resembled the thousand-pound grizzlies of North America, but would have been the more diminutive native Syrian bears, which hardly moved the needle of the scales at 400 pounds. 400 pound bears versus a crowd of children instead of a thousand pound bears. I'm not exactly sure of the importance in pointing out this difference. Personally, I don't think it's significant whether the attack was made by a pair of 400 pound bears or a pair of 70 pound German shepherds. The fact is, the animals were sent by God, which given the supernaturalist worldview of Christian apologists and creationists, could have ripped apart New York City in an afternoon without chipping a nail much less tear through a squirrely group of street urchins in ancient Israel. These bears came from God, empowered with his divine wrath to exact vengeance in the name of the Lord at the behest of his holy prophet. If God can part the Red Sea with a whirlwind, he can lay to waste 42 kids with a pair of bears, no matter what the children's age is. For holding the bears would have had to have been infused with superpowers in order to maul all those kids, and. For whatever reason, this isn't possible under Holding's interpretation of the story. Funny how Holding's imagination suddenly leaves him hanging here, isn't it? He just can't imagine the bears somehow received a generous helping of divine power to fulfill Elijah's curse. Instead, in order to meet the scripture's description of the bears mauling the children, Holding imagines the youths actually having the nerve to fight back against the enraged bears. But the humor doesn't stop there. In Holding's online print edition of his apologetic, he even goes so far as to suggest this roving pack of vagrants would have seen the bears as many Walmarts, and thus engaging the bears could have yielded meat for food, furs for blankets or clothes, <laughs> teeth for tools or jewelry, and bones for soup. But he doesn't stop there. His imagination in full control of his faculties holding even pictures the hoodlums fighting back the bears like Klingon warriors, happy to engage the animals for a chance to be injured since injury would grant the honor due to one who had stepped to the plate on the defensive. I'm not making this stuff up, folks. When Holding works himself up into an apologetic lather, there's no telling what far-fetched fantasies this guy can come up with. (laughs) 
And as he concludes his written defense of the story, adding to the bizarre flip-flop of who was actually the victim in this biblical tale, Holding states, The degree of seriousness of the injuries which the thugs would have suffered would have to be faulted to their own decision to react aggressively toward the bears. Now you tell me where any of this nonsense can be found in the biblical tale of Elisha and the bears. I'll save you the trouble. It can't be. But of course, rewriting scripture because God was negligent in his inspiration of such critical details the first time round is part and parcel of the Christian apologetic trade. However, you know what else isn't in the text that Holding overlooked? Swords. What self-respecting gang of thugs would have roamed the Judean countryside without swords? How were they to rob, rape, and pillage in the manner Holding imagines? How were they going to carve up the bears without swords? Get those bones so they could make soup. And monkeys. All good cartoons have monkeys. Monkeys were the hooligans' sidekicks. They were obtained by the gang from merchant caravans coming up out of northern Africa along the trade routes which ran south of Israel. The monkeys were able to climb city walls, because if you read about the architecture of the day, you'd know that many cities in the ancient Near East had walls and go through open windows undetected to help steal jewelry and money while the gang waited outside. Seriously, if you're going to start throwing the stove and refrigerator into the story, might as well toss in the kitchen sink. Now I'm not suggesting that ancient Israel did not suffer from roaming bandits comprised of homeless young men. Certainly Holding can find a reference in one of Bruce Molina's books which discusses these murderous gangs. What I'm trying to figure out is how does Holding cram these fellows into Second Kings in the story of Elijah and the Bears? The task before him is not one in which he merely asserts the connection, but firmly demonstrates it. Where else in scripture are roving criminals referred to as Katan Nayer? Is that phrase used to describe bandits elsewhere in the Old Testament? What is the Hebrew word for robber, bandit, thief? Psst, I'll let you in on a secret. Katan Nayer is never used to describe a sinister mob of thugs terrorizing the Judean countryside. Ever. But if Holding can assert that his youths found the courage, or stupidity, to attack the bears in self-defense, thereby getting mauled, I can just as easily assert that the reason 42 children were cut to ribbons by the two bears is because some were frozen in fear, while others ran panicked in circles, tripping over one another in the chaos, making easy targets for the divinely inspired bears. Holding animates his absurd suggestion that if 42 of these kids were to be mauled by only two 400-pound bears, they would have had to stand in a line, each taking their turn under the bear's massive paws. Of course, as with so many things in Holding's apologetics, this is all in his imagination. It isn't impossible to imagine two enraged 400-pound bears running through a mob of children, each probably weighing no more than 50 or 60 pounds each, taking swipes at them as the Lord commanded. Some of those swipes may have taken off heads, while others ripped into abdomens, but others may have only torn into arms or legs. I say only here in relative terms. It's not an impossible scenario. But then again, we are talking about a biblical story. If Holding wants to argue that two divinely enraged 400-pound she-bears cannot reasonably rip through a confused and frightened crowd of 42 children, he better not start trying to argue about the reasonableness of two and a half million Hebrews at the biblical exodus or about a dead man coming back to life or... Uh, uh, wait a minute. Now it's plainly obvious why apologists like Holding need to expend so much effort over just two verses out of the Bible. They, like the skeptics, recognize the horror of a story depicting God answering a prayer of a humiliated bald man, sending enraged bears out of the woods to maul and murder 42 children. For Holding, the victim of the story becomes Elisha, and the kids mocking him get their divine comeuppance. Because Holding cannot stomach the raw text of the Bible, he feels motivated to rewrite it, attributing Elijah's baldness to a sign of mourning and turning the children into a wild, unkempt bunch of adolescent, disrespectful street hooligans. But I'm curious why Holding got himself so worked up over this particular story of God killing children. There are plenty of other places in scripture where God either orders the killing of children or actually does the deed himself. 
why feel the need to whitewash this particular tale of child murder? None of what Holding imagines is in the text of 2 Kings, but he finds just enough wiggle room in these two sparse verses to force this rewrite into the narrative, all because he needs to protect his belief in an all-loving, all-merciful God who died for him on the cross at Calvary. However, when someone has to stretch that far, they end up falling over. And not only that, but Holding stands against the best Bible translations available to us today, each teamed with scholars who, unlike Holding, are professionally trained in the ancient languages and cultures of the biblical world. But since they all agree that the verses from 2 Kings refers to little children being mauled by Elijah's bears, what's next for Holding's self-publishing empire? His own Bible? I wouldn't put it past him. In the end, Holding's fanciful tale doesn't take note of the Bible's own context. Bethel, outside of which this story takes place, was recently a center of pagan worship. Elisha, a steadfast Yahwist, likely wasn't welcome in this area of the woods. Like modern-day Jehovah's Witnesses or Mormon missionaries, Elijah would have been seen as an annoyance, someone coming along to preach to the residents of Bethel fire and brimstone, sin and damnation. Who wants some spittle-chinned religious nut darkening their doorstep? So the kids banded together to tell the wandering preacher to go home, get out of there. I'm sure many a witness or Mormon would like to call down divine wrath on people who slam the door in their faces. It's just that, in this biblical tale, it really happened. However, the truth of the matter is, the story probably never happened in the first place. It's just another biblical yarn to propagandize the Yahwist cult. But boy, does it pull in the apologists, hook, line, and sinker. <laughs>